Well, would you turn in your Bibles, please, to Psalm 119? I want us once again to look at Psalm 119 and continue looking at David's uh, exaltation of the Word. And uh, he had a, a, great, a great love for the Word of God, a great perspective on the Word of God, and a great desire to serve uh, and obey God and all that God was showing him. And so I'd like us this afternoon to uh, turn to Psalm 119. We're going to look at verses 141 to 144, verses 141 to 144 of Psalm 119. Let me just read those verses to you. Uh, as we're going along, we're, we're coming to the end of the, of the psalm, and he's getting more and more intense as we approach the end. There's really a sense of, of urgency in getting across to us uh, the importance of the Word of God in our lives and, 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 and of seeing ourselves before God. And we have a perfect picture here today of, of how David sees himself in view of the greatness and the glory of God. And he says there, beginning in verse 141 of Psalm 119, I am small and despised, yet I do not forget your precepts. Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your law is truth. Trouble and anguish have overtaken me, yet your commandments are my delights. The righteousness of your testimonies is everlasting. Give me understanding, and I shall live. Father, I pray as we look at your word again this afternoon that you would apply it to our hearts. Father, it's so easy for us to look at the Word and, and not really see it in a personal way. Now, Father, I realize from studying how important it is to, to apply the Word of God to ourselves. Even as a pastor, it's easy to prepare a message in view of speaking to others. But Lord, how important it is that the Word speak to me and to each of us individually. And so I, I thank you, Heavenly Father, for the, the wonderful power of the Word of God to be able to speak directly to the one who is studying it or learning it or hearing it preached. And I pray this afternoon that this word would have a very special impact upon our lives, particularly in the area of showing us the importance of the Word of God, showing us the importance of walking in obedience to it and walking in its precepts. And so, Father, I pray, teach us this afternoon as we reflect upon these four verses, and it's in Jesus' name that I ask it. Amen. Well, one of the outstanding qualities of David's life was his ability to properly evaluate himself. That's one of the things that David was able to do and that really made him what the Bible says or calls a man after God's own heart. I don't think that there's anyone here who would not want to have that qualifier given to him. I think all of us would want to be men or women after God's own heart, or, or men or women who know our place before God, who know our place before God. David had a, a great sense of humility and the ability to recognize his sin. One of the things that we have as believers that is particularly difficult to deal with is we always are able to pick out sin in other people's lives, very unable to pick it out in our own lives. And uh, the Spirit of God has to do a deep work in us often for us to understand that, that it's very easy to look at other people and see their sin and yet pass over our own sin. That's why Jesus was so adamant in the Serpent on the, uh, the, Serpent on the Mount, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, to tell people that before you pluck out the sliver in somebody's eye, make sure you pull the beam out of your own. And, and he, because he realized our innate ability to pass over our own sins and see the sins of others. And, and, and David certainly, because of this attitude, being a man after God's own heart, didn't make him sinless. He was a sinful man. He wasn't sinless by any stretch of the imagination, but rather he was a man that God approved of. God approved of his manner of living. God approved of him because he was a man who evaluated himself according to the standards of Scripture. It's easy to evaluate ourselves according to men's standards, but evaluating ourselves according to God's standards is a whole different issue. And David was the kind of man who wanted to evaluate himself according to God's work, word, who was really seeking, no matter how badly he failed, to bring his life in conformity to, 
to the demands of God's Word. And that, that requires sometimes we be hard on ourselves. And, and that's a very important thing to be. I think as Christians, we, we need to be hard on ourselves. We need to bring ourselves constantly uh, to the foot of the cross and to the foot of the Word of God and to, to really evaluate ourselves from a scriptural perspective. And, and by the way, that's exactly what God requires of all of us. He wants us to do that. He's given us His Word for that purpose. He's given us the Word as a guide. It's really a, it's really a training manual to teach us how to live as Christians, as believers. And even from the very beginning, when God gave the Hebrews His law, they, they, there, was, there was to be there a guide for living. Uh, the, the, the first four commandments taught man how to live in his relationship with God. They related to man's relationship to God. And then the other six were to teach man how to live in his relationship with others. How do we deal with one another? And uh, it wouldn't be a bad idea to go and have a look at that. So if you'd turn with me to Exodus chapter 20, Exodus chapter 20, let's just quickly kind of go through them and, and look and see what God says. Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 and, uh, and 1 and 2 to begin. Exodus chapter 20, of course, is the outline of the Ten Commandments. And uh, even though we're in the New Testament, the Ten Commandments still apply to us, not in the sense of salvation, but in the sense of how we ought to live. And in Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 and 22, we're told, And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. They were to have no idols like the practice of the Egyptian nation. They'd just come out of there. They'd just come out of Egypt. Egypt was a land of constant worshiping of idols. They had all kinds of gods that they worshipped. And so God lays down His law right away with His children out at Mount Sinai as they begin their journey through the desert. He says, you shall have no other gods before me. I will be your only God. Then in verses 4 to 6, He says this, You shall not make for yourselves a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath and that is in the waters under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting iniquity on the fathers of the fathers, on the children to the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. They, they were not to form any kind of an idol. They were not to mold themselves any kind of a God. And, and what's ironic about this is that as God was giving this command, they were down there telling Aaron to make them a god, and he made a golden calf. And uh, Moses came down the mountain and, and broke the tablets of the law. He was so angry. They had broken God's very law as he was giving it to them. And then in Exodus chapter 20, verse 7, he speaks about, about his name. He says, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. He says, you be very careful how you use my name. Be very careful how you, you, you use it in your expressions. Uh, my name is a holy name. And it's not to be taken in a light manner. To take something in vain is to take something as carelessly. And so we need to be very careful about the Lord's name. And then he, he speaks about the Lord's day, how important the Lord's day was in Exodus 20, verses 8 to 11. He says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your sons, nor your daughters, nor your male servants, nor your female servants, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. Give the day off to your employees and tell the tourists that they've got to have a day off too. Everybody in my land, you've got six days to do everything you want to do. On this day, you're going to rest. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. And he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. He set it apart. It was to be a, a set apart day. This was to be the standard in the relationship with God. They were to worship only God. 
They were not to have any idol worship going on. They weren't to worship any objects but God. They were to worship Jesus explained very clearly in the New Testament. They were to worship God in spirit and in truth. They were not to use the the name of the Lord in vain. In fact, any time they used God's name, they would be very cautious about how they used it. And, and then finally, they were to honor the Sabbath, honor the Lord's Day. It was to be a day of rest. And so this was to be their, their relationship. These were the standards for their relationship with God. This is how He wanted them to relate to Him, to put Him first in their lives, to worship Him alone and no other, to honor His name and give Him His day. Uh, that, that was the basic principle, basic fundamental ways that they were to relate to Him. But that wasn't the end of it. They were also to follow the rules in their relationships with each other. They were to live in a certain way with each other. They were to honor elders and seniors and particularly their parents. In Exodus 20 verse 12, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. They were to honor their parents and as believers we're to honor our parents. It doesn't matter what they're like. It doesn't matter what their failures were. We're to honor them. It's an extremely important principle. Then secondly, uh, they were to respect the lives of others and do no harm to other people. Uh, In verse 13, you shall not murder. You can't take the life of another person away from them. They were to honor the bonds of marriage. Exodus 20, 14, you shall not commit adultery. You're, you're, You're not to do anything Uh, that that breaks or dishonors the bonds of marriage. They were to respect the property of others in verse 15. You shall not steal. And and these these are all principles for the protection of society that teaches us how to live. They were to give high priority to the truth. In Exodus 20, 16, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You're to say what's true about others, nothing that is wrong. They were not to be jealous of the prosperity of the possessions of others. In verse 17, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's, not his house, not his car, not his computer, nothing. You're not to covet what other people have. Be satisfied with what God gives you. And don't covet what others have. So God gave four commandments that really governed the people's relationship with Him. And then six commandments that regulate our relationship with other people. These were the guidelines that God gave and expected His people to keep. Now, could they do it? We know they couldn't. At least not consistently. Sooner or later, they became their sinful nature kicked in and they ended up doing something that was wrong. And, and Jesus really raised the standard in the a Sermon on the Mount when He said, you've heard it said of old, you shall not commit adultery. He was relating to this commandment. But I tell you, if a man lusts in his heart when he looks at a woman, he's committed adultery. And so Jesus was saying that these things don't only relate to actions. They relate to intent. They relate to my inner life. You don't have to commit murder to kill somebody, believe me. Sometimes people get killed in our minds, don't they? And, and so he relates to that, how important that is. But sooner or later, because of our sinful nature, we break some of these commandments. David broke these commandments. He broke the commandment of not committing adultery. He broke the commandment of not lying. He broke the commandment of murdering because he murdered, had, mur- had Uriah the Hittite murdered, who was Bathsheba's husband. And so the whole string of things that happened there. And, and God knew from the beginning. And so the law played a dual purpose. The law was really given to call people to obedience, but also to show them their inability to obey and their need of something else in order to be saved. And as a result of that, they, in order to be right with God, they needed to look to someone else to make them right. And that's where the Lord Jesus comes in, through Christ who obeyed each of the commandments because He came and fulfilled the law. He came and obeyed every single commandment And as a result of that, he was able to be a savior, a perfect savior who was able to offer his life in obedience to God on our behalf, replacing our failure with his success and applying that success to the life of each person who would then repent and put their faith in Christ. And so the law had a very important purpose. God gave it to regulate relationship to him and relationship to others, vertical and horizontal, But he knew that sooner or later we would not be able to maintain that law. 
And so he sent Christ his son. So that's just a bit of a background to help us to understand that God has a standard and that we need to see ourselves in light of that standard. And as you examine David's life, David was fully aware of the commandments. He knew the commandments, sought to live his life according to the commandments. But as you examine the life of David, you come to quickly understand that though he failed, and he failed terribly, he failed in ways that maybe some of us have not failed. He went far. Uh, he, he had the sin of lust in his life. He committed adultery with Bathsheba. Uh, and then he, he lied to her husband and tried to trick him into going back to his wife so that his husband, her husband would think that it was his child. And when that didn't work, he had him put at the front lines in the war so that he'd be killed. And so he was responsible for the murder of Uriah. And so th that thing went far. And if the truth were known, David and Bathsheba should have been stoned to death. If the law had been maintained, they should have been stoned to death. And God was merciful. God had mercy on them. It was a great sign of God's mercy. Uh, and, and, and so David failed terribly. Yet, nevertheless, he sought always to bring his life back into conformity. He repented of his sin. And Psalm 51 is the record of David's uh, repentance of his sin with Bathsheba. Uh, and so that, that was really uh, what God, what pleased God. That David was a man who thought, sought to always be in a right relationship with God, uh, with God's revealed standard in His Word. And, and by the way, we all fail. And like David, we all fail terribly in our obedience. But God is a merciful God who, when we confess, receives us, is willing to receive us and put us back on our feet again. And God's Word teaches us uh, this and, and, and that our security and 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 it was David's also, our security is really in the Word of God, in what the Word of God tells us. So let's, let's begin having a look at Psalm 119 here and see how David views the Word of God uh, in, in the area of his security. He begins in verse 141. He says, I am small and despised, yet I do not forget your precepts. Now listen, that's an amazing confession for a man to make let alone the king of the nation. I don't think we would ever expect Queen Elizabeth on her Christmas address to the Commonwealth to come on the TV and say, I am small and despised. I don't think she would ever say that because that's not the way she sees herself. Well, we don't know her heart, but God does. And, but here's David. Here's David penning a psalm that many people will read that was used for worship in the temple. And he said, I, I am small and despised, yet I do not forget your precepts. And, and David displays exceptional humility in this declaration. You know, the, the pride of men's heart is such that to say such a thing takes a huge amount of self-understanding, of self-knowledge. He says that he sees himself as small and despised. That, that little word small is an interesting word. It can mean little or young. And I don't think that David was either of those at this point when he wrote this. I don't think he was necessarily little physically because the Bible just does tell us that he was, he was a handsome looking guy and probably strong and, and all the rest of it. By this point when he's writing it, he's not young either. He's an older man. He's now the king of Israel. So probably neither of those apply. He was probably not small of stature and, and not too young. However, the word can also mean ignoble and insignificant, meaning that he understood his position before God. He understood that before God, he was to be humble. He was to have a humble heart. Some commentators mention that this admission could come because of two things. First, because he understood his own sinful state. You know, there's nothing like falling into sin to show you what a sinner you are. And David had, had plenty of opportunities to fall into sin. And so he was, the, 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 there was no room for doubt. When you talk to David, there was no room for doubt as to whether he was a sinner or not. Because every knew the, everybody knew the Bathsheba story and a few other stories. And so it was quite obvious uh, what his heart was like. And so David really was able to evaluate himself in the light of God's word. And, and he realized that without God's word, that kind of thing would overwhelm him. I mean... You know, sometimes we live with the guilt of our sin. 
sometimes we've done things that we find it hard to forgive ourselves. And you can imagine David as the king of Israel, and now Bathsheba is his wife. He had her husband killed, and now she's his wife sitting on the throne. I mean, a guy would not feel too comfortable, would he? You'd have to be pretty hard-hearted to feel comfortable about that kind of a situation. And so he, he realized, he understood his position before God. His sin had really humbled him. And by the way, that is one of the purposes of sin, isn't it? It's to humble us. And uh, I believe God allows us to fall into sin sometimes just to humble us and, and to bring us to that place where we need to be. And, and so here is David who, who is humbled by God. We also know that David lived with constant threats on his life. There were a lot of people who hated him. There were a lot of people who wanted him taken off the throne. Uh, there were people who were still followers of Saul uh, or from the family of Saul who felt that the throne belonged to them. Um, and, and even David's own son Absalom gave him a pretty hard time regarding his throne. But then David expresses his confidence. He tells where his security is, where it was that he placed his hope, and his hope was in the Word of God. He says, yet I do not forget your precepts. One of of man's greatest problems is his forgetfulness, isn't it? I know that's one of my big problems, is forgetting the past. Sometimes it's important to remember the past. We so quickly forget the things that are important to then be overwhelmed with all the unimportant details. Our lives are filled with situations and circumstances that steal away our happiness and our joy and that cause us a lot of despair and, and loss of hope. Yet, if we could just remember the precepts of God, if we could just remember the Word of God and walk in them, how different our lives would be, how transformed our lives would be. David knew that in spite of his circumstances and all of his difficulties that he faced, the Word of God was secure. The Word of God was unchangeable, and that he could place his confidence In the Word of God, I am small and despised, yet I do not forget your precepts. There's a contrast there. He being small and despised, yet the precepts of God being His security. The Word of God is secure, will never change, and he knew that he could place his confidence in the truth and the promises of the Word of God. And brothers and sisters in Christ, As far as our salvation is concerned, as far as our sanctification is concerned, as far as our needs are concerned, we can rest secure in the promises of God's Word. That is the one place in which we can find great security. To His children, He gives the promise, I will never leave you nor forsake you. How secure is that? Could we have greater security than to know that God will never leave us nor forsake us? Christian, if you're struggling with life today, rest secure in the fact that God has not forgotten you. God has not forgotten me. He will not forsake us or leave us to despair, but He is greatly concerned about us. He has a great concern for His children, and we need to go to Him, tell Him of our condition, and rest assured that He is He is already knowledgeable of it. He already knows everything about us and every circumstance around us. And He has been waiting for us to come. Often I get that sense when I come to God with circumstances and situations, I get that sense that God says, I've been waiting for you. I've been waiting for you to come and talk to me. Come and tell me what is the problem. I am small and despised, yet I do not forget your precepts. David's security was wrapped up in the promises and in the principle of God's Word, the principles of God's Word. He knew the Word of God, he loved the Word of God, and he found his security in the Word of God. Then secondly, in verse 142, he says, Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your law is truth. You know, nothing creates security like the truth. The truth is a great builder of security. On the other hand, lies are the stuff of insecurity. Lies are what make our life insecure. Someone has said that if you you make a practice of lying, then you'll have to have an extremely good memory to remember what you've lied about in the past 
so it does not come back to haunt you when you lie in the future. And so you have to remember all your lies to make sure you don't contradict yourself and, and, and blow it all up. And, and this is def- there's definitely no security in lying. However, the truth always creates tremendous security for us. And David affirms that in the psalm here. He begins by speaking of the righteousness of God. He's already told us earlier in the psalm that God is righteous in His person, that God is a righteous God. But now he tells us that God's righteousness is an everlasting righteousness. It's a righteousness that goes on forever. And in saying this, he's, he's reminding us of the immutability of God. The fact that God never changes, that God is unchangeable. And that, this subject has come up a lot in our, in our discussions in the last little while. We've been talking about the immutability of God. And, and I, I find a great security in that. I trust that you do too. It comforts me to, tremendously to understand that, that God is unchangeable that God is always the same. What He has said in His Word will never change. He remains faithful even if we don't. He continues to be faithful. And so David again confirms this in Psalm 119, speaking of God's righteousness, His being right in doing what is right. God never does anything wrong. No matter how we may perceive it, no matter how we may see it, He will never change. He can never change. And so David qualifies His righteousness is being everlasting. It will always go on. That's a beautiful combination. The righteousness of God and the truth of God. His righteousness is everlasting and His law is truth. God will never change. His truth will never change. And as believers, we should find a tremendous security in that. I'm I'm glad that what God says in His Word, I can apply to my life. I don't have to ever worry that anything will ever change regarding that. It will always remain the same. Then thirdly, in verse 143, he says, Your commandment is my delight. Trouble and anguish have overtaken me. Yet your commandments are my delight. How practical is this verse, 143? It's extremely practical, particularly in view of what David has just said in verse 142. Because David was confident and his security was in the Word of God, he believes in the everlasting righteousness of God, in the immutability of God's person, the unchangeableness of God's person, in the truth of the law. And when trouble comes and overtakes him, he has security. That's great for a believer, isn't it? Troubles and anguish came to David in his life. He had a lot of troubles, had a lot of anguish. And trouble and anguish come to us. I don't suppose anybody here who has never had any trouble or anguish in their life. And I want you to note what they do. They overtake Him. Sometimes as believers, we think that harm can't overtake us. We think we're kind of immune. But in reality, they can overtake us. It can put us in a very difficult situation. We can, as believers, have troubles. And we can have anguish that accompany us and that touch us in a very deep way. But in the midst of them, as David's telling us, the truth of God remains our delight. I was thinking when I was studying this of a biblical example, and I began to think of the rich man and Lazarus. You remember that story? I won't go to it, but the rich man and Lazarus, you soon realize that Lazarus never got any relief during his life. It was just a life of trouble and anguish. He remained a beggar, a sick man, who had oozing sores. The Bible tells us that dogs would come and lick his sores. His only relief came when he died and when he was carried into the bosom of Abraham. But the rich man who sat in his house and could see Lazarus outside his window sitting at his gate begging because a lot of rich people would come into the rich man's house and so they would put Lazarus at the gate there so that as rich people were coming in he could beg from them and pretty much a lot of people ignored him but when Lazarus was carried into the bosom of Abraham he looked over and there was the rich man in hell there was the rich man in hell but all through his life that man Lazarus Even though he was in trouble, 
and he was in anguish, continued to place in confidence and find his security in God's word and in God's commandments. We know that because he was a believer. He ends up in heaven in the bosom of Abraham. And so we know, without the Bible even telling us, that this poor man, this sick man who was begging for his subsistence was blessed of God, even in the midst of his trouble and his anguish. Now, most of us know nothing of that kind of a life. We've got everything we need. We live in luxury, really, compared to, to this man. But this man had great confidence. The Word of God was his delight. Now, that's a real test, isn't it? What if we were to lose all that we have? And nothing, you know, nothing guarantees that life will continue as it is right now in the future. We don't know what's going to happen. But what if we were to lose all that we have, our finances, I'm looking at the United States right now, and we're hearing about all that's going on. I mean, what if everybody in the United States found out that the, the government had to go into their bank accounts and pull all the money out because they needed it to govern the country? And all of a sudden, all these people that had bank accounts had nothing left, or something happened, the economy collapsed, and the American dollar wasn't worth a cent, and all of a sudden, you got all this money in the bank, and it's gone in an instant. People have gone through that when they've got into fraudulent ventures or, or things like that. What if we lost all of our finances? What if we lost all of our material wealth, our house burnt down, lost all our furniture, everything is gone? What if we lost our health? What if all of a sudden we broke out in some cancer of the skin that, and all our body was just covered with sores and ulcers? And so we've got no more money. We've got no more material goods. Our physical health is going. And we found ourselves lying on a gurney in the hospital ignored by doctors and nurses because there was just nothing they could do for it for us could we still lay there in our trouble and our anguish and find delight in the word of god that's an amazing test i hope i never have to go through it i really do but that is the real test of faithfulness to god that is a test that god seldom sends to people and thankfully so but we don't know the future. And some of us may experience some of those things. And today is the day to love and appreciate the Word of God. You know, if a situation like that happens to a person, they won't suddenly begin to love the Word of God. The Word of God needs to be loved first. We need to first have that great love for the Word of God, and then when those circumstances happen, then we will appreciate the truth of God's Word. We'll rest in Christ, rest in our hope. That was David's security. You know, as the king of the nation, when Absalom, his son, came to attack Jerusalem, David had to give up everything. He had to walk out of the city and go and hide in the hills. He was the king. He had to leave with all the people that were with him and go and hide in the hills somewhere while Absalom came and took over his throne. What a thing. He appreciated the word of God. He rested in the Word of God. And maybe these were some of the things that were on his mind when he was writing this psalm. And finally, in verse 144, uh, he says, Your testimonies are everlasting. Uh, the righteousness of your testimonies is everlasting. Give me understanding, and I shall live. Note here as, as we close David's reference again to the righteousness of God. And this time, the righteousness of his testimonies. And to the fact that they are everlasting. David finds a real confidence and a real security in the Word of God because he does not forget, we saw in the first verse, he does not forget God's Word. It's always there, and there's a sense in that word forget of, of thinking of everything else except the Word of God. And yet David has the Word of God firmly engrafted in his mind, and that's where he goes first. You know, the big danger of not being a student of the Word of God is that when trouble comes to your life, you'll look at everything else before you look at the Word of God. But if you're a student of the Word of God and you love God's Word, no matter what happens, you look to the Word of God first. And I believe that ought to be our first perspective. We ought to look first to the Word of God. does not forget the Word of God because He knows the Word of God to be the truth. If we don't believe the Word of God is the absolute truth, it's going to be very hard to trust in it. It's going to be very hard to rest in it when trouble and anguish come our way. And then he delights in the Word of God. He finds his joy in the Word of God. Where do we find our joy? 
Do we find our joy in all kinds of material things and worldly things? Or do we find our joy in the Word of God? Do we hunger for it? I preach on Sunday, and so when I get home on Sunday after, I'm looking for a preacher. And so I go on TV and I watch a service down in California and listen to a sermon. Why? Because I want the Word preached to me. Even though I'm preaching, it's, I'm still preaching to myself, but on the Lord's Day, I really want that. I want the Word preached to me. And I want to hear it. I, I just want to hear it right until I go to bed at night. And, uh, and, and that's our security. That's our love. For, that's our delight in the Word of God. Listen, when you delight in something, you want to be with it all the time. You know, if you delight in your computer, you're on your computer all the time. If you delight in your wife, you're spending all your time with your wife. If you delight in your family, you spend time with your family. If you delight in the, God, in the Word of God, you've always got this close to you. You've always got the Word of God close. What a great security it is for a believer who has placed his trust in God to realize that that trust is not only in God, but in the Word of God. In the Word of God. God's truth, God's Word is the security of the believer. That's why David asks for understanding. He wanted understanding of the Word because it's one thing to know the Word of God, and we talked a little bit about this this morning, but it's one thing to know the Word of God, but it's an entirely different thing to understand the Word of God. Knowledge, knowledge alone will only take you so far in your relationship with God. You can have a lot of knowledge, but it'll only take you so far. You need to have understanding. And understanding of the Word of God comes through life experience, applying the Word of God. The wisest man who ever lived understood that very well. And the reason he understood it is because his father David taught it to him. And you'll find that very interesting in Proverbs chapter 4. And I want to close there, but would you turn to Proverbs chapter 4, verses 1 to 9? Solomon is said to have been the wisest man in the world, at least in part of his life. And there was a principle that he learned from his father David. And he talks about it in Proverbs chapter 4, verses 1 to 9. Listen to what it says. Solomon is writing the Proverbs for his sons. He wants his sons to be wise. And so he wrote this, Hear, my children, the instruction of a father, and give attention to no understanding. Interesting. For I give you good doctrine or good teaching. Do not forsake my law. Then he refers to his father David. When I was my father's son, tender and the only one in the sight of my mother, he also taught me. And said to me, and the rest of the passage is a quote from David, Let your heart retain my words. Keep my commands and live. Get wisdom. Get understanding. Do not forget nor turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her, and she will preserve you. Love her, and she will keep you. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And with all you're getting, get understanding. Exalt her, and she shall promote you. She will bring you honor when you embrace her. She will place on your head an ornament of grace, a crown of glory she will deliver to you. Solomon learned from his own father David the importance of understanding. David, you can imagine David, who's given us all these psalms, you can imagine the kind of relationship he had with his boys. Now, a lot of his boys didn't turn out very well. But uh, you can imagine how he treated probably Solomon more than the others because Solomon was destined for the throne. David would have imparted to them the importance of the law, the importance of God's word as the king. And he lived a life of, of confident trust in God's word. It was his own security, even as the king of Israel. And he told his son that it would be his... And he's telling us that it's ours as we read the Word of God. And so we have to ask ourselves the question, is the Word of God our security today? Do we trust in the Word of God? Is it the center of our life? Does it have our affection? We need to have the Word of God firmly ingrained in our life.
We need to study the Word. We need to understand its principles if we are going to be successful in our service with God. And some of that takes a long time. In fact, I dare say it takes a lifetime to even understand some of the principles of God's Word. There is so much that's contained in this book. But it's imperative for us, it's important for us to truly understand the principles of God's Word and to live by them, not only to please God, but also to find security in this life. We'll find great security in our love for the Word of God. Well, let's pray together as we close. Heavenly Father, we thank You once again this afternoon for this time in the Word. We pray, Lord, that You would bless it to our understanding, that, Heavenly Father, we would be people who not only have knowledge of the Word, but also an understanding of it, that we would be practicing it and living it out in our daily lives, that, Heavenly Father, Your Word would meet us there where our needs are, that we would learn in every circumstance to, to turn to Your Word and to find great confidence in it, to find great security in it. Now, as we go out into our week, Father, none of us knows what's awaiting us. We just pray, O Lord, that You would guide us through it. We pray, O Lord, that You would use us as we seek to minister to people around us and that we might be a blessing for others. And it's in the name of Jesus, Your Son, that we ask it. Amen.